You're listening to the Biohackers World Podcast. Hello, I'm Jason Pensick, and I'm here at the Biohackers World Miami right now, hanging out with Clayton Thomas. He's the founder and owner of The Root, or the therootbrands.com would be the, the where we go to send you. Now, Clayton has been doing this for about 25 years, right? You've been in, in this idea of detox. You thought it was a, you were doing it before it's cool. So yeah. <laughs> um, what I'm here to talk about is basically kind of detoxification, kind of understand what's going on with the population in general and why we're getting more and more sick and what to do about it. So um, when did you realize that basically almost every chronic condition started with needing some detoxification? You know, growing up in an integrated veterinary practice, this is actually something I learned with my parents when I was like eight or 10 years old. You know, of really starting to identify terrain theory because a lot of you know what we what we study in medicine has been tried in animal medicine long before it's brought into human medicine. Uh, but animals animals are you know the literal canary in the coal mine, right? So, you know what my what my parents saw in practice was identifying what issues were and going away from the traditional establishment. They moved away from the pharma space and veterinary medicine really on in their career because of, of seeing, seeing some of the issues, but asking some of the questions. And, you know, as I went through my childhood into college athletics and, you know, studying things and got out of college and started my professional life and blended, you know, what I'd learned as a kid, uh, about 20, 20 years ago, my entire world shifted conceptually, because we've always talked about diet, lifestyle, exercise, these components of what we can do to add into our lifestyle. But I had a moment where everything flipped and literally took a, um, a redirection, 180 degrees as you can look at it, and understood that the, the equation for our health and function and performance was actually addition by subtraction. And then, you know, before, you know, we had access to the information we have, I got on PubMed and started doing research. And what I found is like the World Health Organization had published in 1976 that mercury alone was the cause of what they knew at the time about 85% of all chronic degenerative diseases. And you go, wait a minute. So if you, if you know what the true ideology is and the underlying cause, and then you understand the nefarious nature of what that one substance does in the, in the human body and in the biosphere, right, of how it disrupts things, then you, then you can start tracing the, the pathways of disruption through you know, what have become different diagnoses. And then you understand that a diagnosis is only a compilation of symptoms, which provides a mechanism of a treatment protocol um, that has been built through one specific system, right? And, you know, through travel, you know, I just, just like in my, you know, spiritual belief system, I studied everything from all over the world to get an idea of what that meant. So when you look at healthcare, if you just look at the United States approach, it's going to leave you deficient because you've got cultures that have, you know, centuries or millennia experience in dealing with the electromagnetism of the human body and function. And my parents saw that in practice uh, when my dad started doing Chinese herbs and, you know, the combination of specific herbs and either treating things or using in surgery. I can remember him coming home and going over the questions he was asking this master Chinese herbalist, you know, the first time she was training him on what to do. He asked, he's like, okay, why do you use this combination? And she's like, because my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather did it that way. And he's like, okay, I get it. And so it, it's, it's truly understanding cause, right? It's like this combination, the conversation that people have about inflammation is the cause of disease. Okay, great. Fire burns trees and burns down houses. Great. What caused the fire? You know, it's like, okay, yes, we know fire's bad. Yeah. Okay. Fire inflammation. Okay. Yes. But what's causing it? That's, that's the key. And that's where mercury and the other environmental toxins come in. And that's the foundation. So moving into the, the detox, we talk about cellular detox. That's big for your thing. What's the difference between you know, when you talk about cellular detox and people come in and say, oh, I'm detoxing right now. I'm, I'm doing, you know, my detox shake. I'm going home. They get their, you know, products online. They go on Amazon. They're like, I got this great detox. Uh, I'm doing it. What, what's like the difference? What do you, why cellular detox is so important? Being able, you can, you can look at the body like a, a masterpiece. It's been up in someone's attic for a couple hundred years or more. And you, you've got this work of art, but time has built this patina 
over it of dirt and grime and you know the the amalgamation of all of that environmental exposure over decades you know that's built up and you can't hit it with a pressure washer right because you're going to destroy the work of art and you can't do it fast you know so it's a it's a process but it's also understanding that you have to use the right tools in order to do it and we live we live in a in a world in the United States where marketing is more powerful than science and but there is a distinct difference between truth and trust right and you know that's the trick of 90 to 95% truth and 5 to 10% lies that you can say oh I'm you don't I'm doing this detox great why are you not better why are you not seeing these kind of outcomes why why is what you're taking not published or already proven to have specific outcomes and it's the difference between talk and performance and and having the right people because you can you can look at a restaurant you know, you're in Chicago so you know good food yeah. right and if if you go to a restaurant and someone's using shitty ingredients and they're making a pizza, but they're using glyphosate laden, you know, really poor flour. They're using synthetic cheese. They're using synthetic pepperoni and they're using pasta sauce out of a can. And they're like, oh, we make the best pizza. And then you go next door and somebody's sourcing, you know, some of the best flour that you can get that has no GMOs, no bromelate in it. And they're mashing their own, you know, p tomatoes that are grown in a specific area. They're growing garlic that they're getting from a specific area. They're getting cilantro that, you know, they've got the farm where the pigs are being grown and they're getting this amazing, you know, pepperoni. And then you've got a chef that knows exactly the right ingredients and the right combinations. And then they're doing something really unique with it. They might be praying over, you know, what they're creating. They might have set an intention. They might be playing music and some specific things to program that. And they might be using a lot of love that's actually intended to go into that process. You're going to have two pizzas, but you're not going to have the same experience. And that component is what's crucial in, in our world now of knowing not just, oh, I'm taking this. I heard about this substance. And one of the things that drives me nuts in marketing is people talking about single ingredients or single components like this ashwagandha or magnesium is amazing. You need this. I'm like, God bless it. It's like saying flour is great. Eat anything with flour. I'm like, woosa, you know understanding how it's done, the, the creator, the intention behind it. And we live in a world that's been bioscience engineered and you better have a bioscience engineer that understands what's going on in the environment and then how to take nature and literally program nature accordingly. And that's what you know, Christina's done in design and function and structure, but then we've got proof yeah. and it's published. And the intellectual property, the patents behind the specific protocols based on the outcomes to show clinical pathways and proven outcomes is what sets this apart. Yeah. And that's really where I'm going next. You guys are all about validation testing. This is yeah. what you've set yourself apart from other companies. Are there specific biomarkers, lab markers that you're telling people to get, to look at that you can see change when you start using? Uh... I, I'm not one on spending a lot of money where you don't have to, right? But you can you know, if you want to track it clinically, I mean, there's a whole host of ways of doing that. We're bringing some innovations into the market as far as compiling all of that data and uh, decentralizing all of that data for consumers so they own and control it. Um, but, you know, if you're doing heart rate variability analytics, if you're doing blood work, if you're doing urine, you know, if if you're just looking at your lifestyle and how your body's functioning, you're paying close attention to it, you can see changes really quickly. Um, you know, what what we've done, like with the patent we have on reversing autism, right there, there's the clinical, clinical markers that you can see. But then if you have a child that's not spoken in you know, two years or in 12 years and, and has, you know, different lifestyle components that are measurable, and then you're overlaying that with clinical components, you know, or, you know, specific disease states, you can take those and you have a case study that you can write up, but then you can also do that in a case series if you see it consistently with the same protocols. You know, so it depends. I mean, some people don't have the money to do all the testing, and sometimes the testing is just a way that, that practitioners or different people can make money. So 
Yeah. I mean, you see this in, being in clinic. Practice. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of testing everything because I know everyone's got a toxic load of some sort. Yeah. We do do um, some toxic testing for mold, heavy metals, glyphosates, uh, and, um, you know, Lyme disease is pretty common, one of the common things we do. And it's pretty much understood one of those things is causing the issue. They're all, they're all part of the same process. And I think that's, and Christina, you know, it was actually one of the first people in the country to be diagnosed with Lyme when she was 19. She fell in a tick bed in North Carolina at a church camp and had a 105 degree temperature for a couple of weeks and was crazy of her, of her journey. So she's one of the first people in the country to have, have Lyme's disease in college, lost her memory. She grew up, could speed read and had a photographic memory, lost her memory, didn't know where she was from, didn't know her birthday, didn't know, know who she was. Through staying in school, took two years to recover, but ends up getting a master's degree, a couple of PhDs, now more than that. But in her, in her biotech career, went from the um, clinical psychology standpoint into, into Pfizer. So she was at Pfizer at the heyday. And because of her clinical research background, she ended up doing some military research at Camp Pendleton, you know, with the military and looking at stuff. And she, she tells the story about being in the C-suite and doing, talking over research projects with some of the military. And they were talking about how they weaponized fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. And, and how, you know, what they've done with Lyme disease. And she was like, um, hold on, I got a question. Because she's in her late 20s. At the time, she's like, um, I've had Lyme's disease. And they're, they're like, well, there's, there's no way because we did that in Europe. We didn't do it here. She's like, you really think that they don't travel? And she was like, oh, boy. And so being around the truth... Uh, but the big thing with Lyme's disease is it's becoming a really big topic of conversation because it's bacterial, right? And Lyme, you know, these these little bacteria are highly intelligent. But the one part that's not talked about is the, the frequency aspect of how the body communicates. But um, Lyme's transmitted through sex, through fluids. It, it's worse than what the AIDS – remember when AIDS was was popular back in the day and no one wanted to sit on the toilet seat, Right. Lime's worse, right? So uh, the with the documentary Brain on Fire that came out a long time ago that people are talking about now, if you, if you watch both, you have the story of a couple where the girl has Lyme's disease and her husband is, you know, helping her through the process of working to get better and she has some improvements and that's kind of the the end of the first first documentary. Well, they continued to follow the couple. She got better. But when they did the second documentary, she was better. He got Lyme. He fell apart because of what he was exposed to from her. So you, you have to understand that these issues are populational now, right? So it's not just, oh, this one little thing is in, in one person, that it has spread across the population. And you could, you could pretty much theoretically argue that the majority of the pop, we know that we have fungal issues, and that means we have you know, some semblance of parasitic issues. That also means we have bacterial issues. You will, you will see things flare based on the function of your body energetically and immunologically. That if stress and other environmental factors inhibit your function, you're going to see these things kick up. And it's not because something new just came up. It's that something is overriding the rest of the operating system. So it's, it's prevalent. So I guess the real question is, how often, how much are we being exposed? I mean, I talked to you earlier, you make a coffee, which is mold free and people don't understand. Coffee and mold are very synonymous. If you're drinking regular coffee and you don't get a mold free coffee, that's not great for you. We are yeah. just being exposed to mold all the time. So I guess how often are people being exposed? Because I guess the big question is, when you detox is great, but you should detox after you've given some exposure and take some stuff out. So what are we? It's important to understand when it starts, right? Which is conception. Right. And the, the, I think that's a hard part for people to understand. And I was talking to somebody yesterday. They're like, oh, yeah, Mercury's passed through three generations. I'm like, no, it's actually seven. You know, so you've got the worst neurotoxin known. And what I've learned over the last couple of years is when we look at the when we look at spiritual trauma or we look at energetic trauma and past life trauma that, you know, people are talking about a lot. We're not born with a backpack. We're not made to carry these things with us energetically, spiritually, psychologically. Um, but what's interesting is the nefarious nature of 
mercury because it's plus one, plus two, or plus three. If it's blocking a binding site, it's a, a negatively charged binding site, and it's positive. If it's plus two or plus three, it still holds a positive charge, so it can hold on to negatives, but it doesn't have to be physical like a binding site. It can be electrical. It can be spiritual. It can be energetic. So the issues that we're seeing people are having with these past life issues or trauma from the past and post-traumatic stress is not the stressors themselves. It's the energetic component of what mercury is holding on to to create these issues. But when you, when you look at our, our exposure, it's every second of every day that you've been alive, which is from conception to the day that you leave the skin suit. And you have to address that in accordance with the environment that we live in. So it's not, oh, I did this 30 day detox challenge, or I just did this, you know, I had this detox smoothie, or I did this and it was good. And I did this for a month, or I did this for a 90 day challenge. Great. And then what? Right. Because you have massive amounts of environmental toxins that are sequestered in, in tissue, especially when you look at the nefarious ones. If you look at glyphosate, if you look at mercury, lead and aluminum, right, they are they are not in your circulatory system. They're stored very quickly. Now, if you have lots in your circulatory system, if they're in your blood, you're being chronically exposed. But your kidneys, your liver, your brain, your central nervous system, adipose tissue, joints, areas of, of injury, areas of increased ionic activity, like a concussion, cause the amalgamation of these metals very, very quickly, or they'll build up in your kidneys, they'll build up in your liver, they'll build up in your brain. Those are not things that you get out just by drinking a smoothie or doing something. You have to go get them, and then you also have to assist the body in reactivating its natural biological pathways for detoxification, which can only be done through physical support and energetic support. And if this is not something that you're doing consistently, you might get a little bit, but you're, you're basically pissing in the pool and you're not in a kiddie pool. You're in a freaking ocean. You're like, oh, well, I, I made a drop here, so it's better. You got a long way to go. And it is, and it is the consistency of, of doing this, that if you do this over a prolonged, consistent period of time, you're going to see benefits because the restoration of that masterpiece is not something that's done in a couple of days. It's not something that's done in a couple of weeks. It, it could take years. And if you look at the, the approaches of what we understand from integrative health um, and naturopathic medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, it's usually you're going to look at one month of true therapy for every year that you've had an exposure. So depending upon how old you are, you can go, okay, I'm 40 years old. Okay, you can expect at least 40 months of a process that is going to lead you back to being outstanding. Now you can speed that process up if you do it really, really well, but it's not something you can fix quickly. And that's the problem is we live in a microwave-based society. I mean, we run social media, you're like I can watch a, you know, a video now for 37 seconds where it used to be two minutes and it used to be 30 minutes. And it's like, shit, now we can't even watch a movie because they break <laughs> it up into 27 minute segments because we can't even pay attention. Yep. So yeah, it's, it's that process of, of going through understanding what we're here for. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, in my own practice, we see atherosclerosis, heart disease being tied to heavy metals all the time. And so it's true with nitric oxide, the big conversation yeah, yeah. of nitric oxide. And uh, Dr. Mark Houston is a buddy of mine in, in, in Nashville and he's the leader in the, in the research. And I was talking to Mark a couple of years ago. I'm like, bro, if you look at nitric oxide, but it's the heavy metals that cause the damage to the endothelial lining that cause the reduction in nitric oxide. So taking nitric oxide isn't going to solve the problem. You've got to re remove the metals, allow that endothelial lining to regenerate, and then the body will produce it. But it's the difference between looking at it endogenous production and just saying, oh, well, it's broken. Let's just give you a, a quick fix. Yeah. Which and there is, is no quick fix. No, which is why you have to do the detoxification, which is why you need cellular detox, which is why the root exists. Is You have yeah. root here to help with cellular detoxification. So I, Clayton, I thank you so much for coming here and joining us. It's great. Again, Biohackers World, really great for having you here. Thank you for sitting down and really appreciate your time today. Thanks for letting me hang out. We'll do more. Thanks. I'm already looking forward to the next events in 2026, Los Angeles and to Chicago and to New York. And I know in January after, there's gonna be Miami as well.